Old Man Stauff built a house and filled it with his toys. Six guests were invited one night, their screams the only noise. You play as the seventh guest, wandering around the halls, following the trail of ghosts contained within these walls. Entranced by puzzles at every turn, enslaved by Henry's games, his voice echoing within you chills the blood inside your veins. Oh, you've thrilled me to the soul. The mansion of a child killer, you entered in the night. But what is it about this place that causes such a fright? Welcome to the Scare Lab, where we study such a scene with old man staff surveying us. Crazy, sick, and mean. The Seventh Guest is a CD-ROM game developed by Trilobite and published by Virgin Interactive Entertainment in 1993. It is an interactive puzzle game with horror elements and made full use of full motion video that became more popular in the 90s, indeed being heralded as one of the trendsetters that caused a brief FMV boom along with Myst. Not only credited with popularising FMV, but it was one of the first games, if not the first game, to be published on CD-ROM and actually caused gamers to frantically rush out and purchase CD-ROM drives specifically for the purpose of playing the game. It sold over 2 million copies and according to GameInformer.com was called a new standard in interactive entertainment by Bill Gates. While the FMV graphics and point-and-click gameplay may seem primitive by today's standards, at the time of release it was a truly creepy experience, chilling players to the bone with the horrifying voice of Henry Stauff following you around the house. But what made it so terrifying? In the words of George the Fat Man Sanger, The storyline of the seventh guest is laid out in the introductory video to the game. Henry Stauff, a homeless drifter, in a fit of desperation, murders a woman and steals her purse. During the night, he has visions of a beautiful toy doll. He carves the doll to the exact specifications of his dream, and the owner of a local bar becomes enamoured with it, offering Stauff room and board in exchange for the doll as a gift for his daughter. Stauff continues to have these visions of more toys, some of them dolls, some of them puzzles, and crafts each and every one, eventually opening his own toy store with immense success. However, the children who possess one of Stauff's toys suddenly fall ill to a mysterious illness, and eventually pass away. His final vision is of a mansion filled with puzzles. He uses his fortune to build the mansion and invites six guests with the promise of whatever their heart desires. However, a seventh guest sneaks into the house. A child named Tad, who entered the house on a dare. The guests try to capture Tad at Stauff's command. You play as Ego, a seemingly unrelated character who wakes up in the mansion with no memory of how he arrived, witnessing ghostly visions of the past and forced to solve the puzzles and find a way to escape. Henry Stauff is a child murderer. That fact is clear upon completion of the game. Henry Stauff has finally captured Tad and it is revealed that his soul is required for Stauff's pact with an evil force to be completed. Stauff was entirely aware that his dolls were killing children. A small price to pay to not be forced into robbery to simply survive. I believe I'm probably able to speak for the majority of the population when I say this is abhorrent. As I stated in my video exploring Doki Doki Literature Club, the harming of an innocent life is one of the worst things a human being can do. While researching for this video, I came across an article published by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention that included a note stating the following. Homicides are always tragic, but our sympathies are heightened when the victim is a young child or adolescent. I will not go into further detail on this topic, as I believe that the reason the player fears Henry Stauff is self-explanatory with the prior mentioned context. 
He has committed heinous acts and has ensnared his guests into committing similar acts in exchange for reward, all to complete a pact with an evil force. It is probably safe for the player to assume that this evil force is the devil. After all, Stauf is not only a reference to the German toy company Steif, but also an anagram of Faust. Faust is a German legend of a scholar who, succumbing to desperation and boredom, makes a pact with the devil for knowledge and power in exchange for his soul. It is widely believed that the character of Faust was based on a real person, a gentleman by the name of Johann George Faust, born in approximately 1480, who apparently described himself as the chief of necromancers, astrologer, the second magus, palmist, diviner. It is obviously highly unlikely that the real Faust made a pact with the devil, but that doesn't mean that people weren't afraid of this possibility at the time, causing the German legend to be written and adapted in as many forms as it has. In her article Two Discourses on the Devil, Ulrika Wolf Notes explains, the human being has no advantage or happiness to gain from contact with the devil. On the contrary, individuals should stay as far away from the devil as possible. Those who would willingly seek an audience with the devil for their own personal gain are, in the eyes of religion, morally corrupt and acting against God. These people are to be feared, for we cannot be certain of what powers they have been granted. In the case of Stauf, he has already murdered children, as was shown in the introduction to the game, and now you are trapped in his house. Who knows what he might do to you? The 3D video games first began to emerge in the early 70s, with games like Space Sim, however most of the popular games still featured 2D graphics and side-scrolling until the 80s, when Pseudo 3D began to see a boom. According to itstillworks.com, the 80s saw the rise of Pseudo 3D graphics, where game programmers would use either physical graphical projections to give the illusion of 3D, or use basic 3D gaming environments limited to a 2D plane. The late 80s and early 90s were an era where video game graphics were fully starting to transform, transitioning from 16-bit graphics to 32-bit systems. 1992 saw the release of Wolfenstein 3D, largely credited as one of the first fully 3D games to hit the market and help push consumers towards first-person shooters. The seventh guest features a 3D rendered mansion environment, and the puzzles throughout the game utilise this 3D feature, with elements of the puzzles appearing to jump out at the player. As well as the puzzles, aspects of the house are made more horrifying with the use of 3D graphics, such as the creepy painting at the top of the stairs. As you move from location to location, the camera moves along with you, simulating actual movement throughout the house, although some aspects of this movement do appear to defy physics and logic, such as transporting through a pool table and ending up in the oven. One of the most unsettling uses of this technology is found in the crypt section, where you are forced to navigate an ungodly maze, with the voice of Henry taunting you if you make a wrong turn. The enclosed walls are claustrophobic, and you emerge on the other side only to be met with nine coffins, a victory hardly worth the journey. Full motion video had been experimented with in the 70s and 80s, but hadn't really gained popularity until the 90s, when photorealism was beginning to become the norm. As stated by Aki Yavinen in his article, Grand Stylissimo, the audio-visual elements and styles in computer and video games, the most obvious example of photorealism in the recent history of games are the numerous adventure games from the mid-1980s, where actors were filmed in actual sets and locations. These sequences were incorporated into the game's graphical backgrounds, or full motion video was used. The Seventh Guest was one of the first games to popularise this trend, thus making the graphics at the time a technical marvel and frighteningly realistic. The full motion video in this game was entirely utilised in the depictions of the ghosts, which explains why the images of the actors are transparent throughout their appearances. This ensures that the limitations of the technology at the time work in the game's favour and allow the ghostly apparitions to seem more realistic. The actors were filmed against a green screen, or in this case a blue screen, and were then projected over the graphics of the game, allowing the actors to interact with the fictional house. This of course proved somewhat of a challenge, and the actors had to adapt their performances accordingly. With this particular type of shooting, 
we had the camera locked down, everything was from a, a long shot, a long angle, and it was um, difficult getting the facial emotion across. Instead of just a, a simple darling, we would have to use whole body movement. Darling! Similar to that with everything. Um, in that way, it was similar to stage. The use of actual actors in the game allowed the player to be as immersed as they would be into a television show or movie, with the added bonus that they could interact with this new world. Some of the graphics used in the game are downright disturbing, and have stuck with me for a very long time. For example... Oh, this isn't real! One of the most iconic elements of this game, and indeed one of my favourite aspects, is the audio. First, let's start with Henry Stauff, played by the fantastic Robert Hirschbeck. His voice is absolutely perfect for this role, and harkens back to the stylings of Vincent Price, whose voice is so cemented in our brains as the quintessential voice of horror, from his work in House on Haunted Hill and House of Wax, to his feature on Michael Jackson's Thriller, and even spooking us as children in The Thirteen Ghosts of Scooby-Doo. Only you can return the demons to the chest. Robert Hirschbeck's voice has a similar cadence to that of Vincent Price, and his evil laugh, as seen at the end of the soup clip, is just as chilling. His voice follows you throughout the hall, and becomes associated with your failure. Give up? He mocks you if you make a wrong move, he hurls insults at you as you try to solve his puzzles, and he whispers to the guests in the house to force them to do his bidding. I could honestly talk about Robert Hirschbeck's voice for the remainder of this video if I wanted to, but I will refrain. Instead, I implore you to watch the video Henry in the Night, featuring Mr. Hirschbeck himself, reading poems written by Henry Stauff. This was originally created as part of the Seventh Guest 3 Kickstarter project, but still puts a smile on my face even now, as well as sending a chill down my spine. But Robert Hirschbeck isn't the only iconic aspect of the audio for the game. I must draw attention to the music. The music for both The Seventh Guest and its sequel The Eleventh Hour was composed by George Sanger, aka The Fat Man whose portrait actually hangs in the gallery in the game. The Fat Man has composed music for a great number of games throughout his career, most notably Wing Commander and Maniac Mansion, but his music for the seventh guest in the eleventh hour are some of my favourite pieces of all time, and a copy of the album was included with the release of the game. The MIDI soundtrack aligns perfectly with the mood of both the house and the individual scenes, with orchestral chords in the chapel, and abrupt noises to signify a wrong turn in the maze. This was becoming the norm in this era, along with the graphical developments, where the music within the game would have an impact on the player, increasing the heart rate in certain scenes, or giving the player a hint as to where to go. The main theme of the seventh guest also begins, as the fat man himself explained in an interview with RMC, with a pitch bend, which can sound extremely unsettling. This, along with the theme being composed in the minor key for the most part, which is synonymous with sadness or fright, allows the soundtrack to enhance the creepy environment you find yourself in. The music in the game is impossible to ignore, with one of the featured puzzles in the game being a Simon Says playthrough of the main theme. Due to this puzzle, the music will stick with you. If only for how annoying this puzzle can be on occasion. Hopefully this video will also allow the music of the Fat Man to stick in your head. Every piece of music you have heard in this video 
is from the 7-Eleven album, a collection of music from the 7th guest and the 11th hour. This has been used with permission from the fat man himself, for which I am eternally grateful. If you love this music as much as I do, please check out his Bandcamp page, where you can purchase the 7-Eleven album, as well as his other fantastic works. You won't regret it, and if you're anything like me, you'll find yourself singing this for a week. The Seventh Guest is one of my favourite games of all time. I have been obsessed with this game ever since I was a kid, and have owned more copies of it than I care to admit. I even own a CDI copy of the game, and I don't own a CDI console. And I couldn't talk about this game without briefly mentioning a book written by Matthew Costello, which I also own, because of course I do. The odd thing is, this game isn't the one that truly scared me as a child. It was creepy, sure, but I wasn't at the age to fully understand it. The game that did truly horrify me was The Eleventh Hour. Both of these games are absolute staples in the horror video game genre that I implore you to play for yourself. Although, for the sake of your own sanity, stay away from the microscope puzzle. And once again, please have a look at the Fat Man's Bandcamp page for some truly fantastic music. Thank you for keeping me company in the Scare Lab today. I didn't like the idea of being in here alone with only Henry for company. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed, share with your friends, and I hope to see you for the next experiment. Take care, and be safe out there. <laughs>